This is All Things Fitness and Wellness, uniting industry thought leaders and fitfluencers on the mission to inspire innovation and encourage people to live a life fit and well. Brought to you by British Columbia Personal Training Institute. Learn how to train, gain, and retain clients. Visit bcpti.ca. It's not often you have the opportunity to interview a superhero, and that's exactly what's happening today. Well, pretty much. We have Andrea Ross, who is a multi-skilled athlete. She does parkour, gymnastics, circus, wire work, and even spent time in the international wrestling circuit. You can spot her skills in action on DC Comics Legends of Tomorrow, Supergirl, Supernatural, and many more titles to her name. On this episode, Ross dives into her experience going from the professional wrestling circuit to becoming a stunt person, and why it's been important to continuously level up along the way. Before we get to it, be sure to hit like and subscribe. We have new episodes of the Industry Series every Monday and new episodes of the Celebrity Series every Wednesday. This is ATFW. As you were walking in, I was telling you how thrilled I am to pick your brain because having such a unique career path means you most likely have a very fascinating story how you got there. And one thing I appreciate from your bio is that you share your level of clumsy kind of collided <laughs> <laughs> into opting for this path. So talk about your early life and relationship to physical activity. As a gymnast, I've been an athlete my whole life. I come from a family of athletes. So my aunt went to the Olympics. My cousins ran. Like it was. What's your aunt go to the Olympics for? Heptathlon. Wow. She's, yeah. So that was the person that I grew up, you know, idolizing because she was the fittest person I had ever met. Um, and my cousins ran, you know, track and field at really like near Olympic levels. And I was also born very clumsy, and so my dad put me in gymnastics when I was three because he's like, this toddler's never going to be an athlete. She needs some coordination. <laughs> and it, I, you know, and I went through competitive gymnastics, and, and out of that, I was able to, you know, do a backflip on a four-inch balance beam four feet off the ground, but I would still trip walking across the street. So it was very, like, select. I can relate to that a little bit. <laughs> I'm known as the clumsy one. <laughs> it's just such selective coordination. Um yeah, and then I got too tall and old for gymnastics at the ripe age of, like, 14. Um, that always feels good when you're uh, in your formidable years <laughs> and yeah. you're like, great, how do I process this when I feel awkward as? Yeah, identity crisis entering high school. What possibly could go wrong? Um, but I was able – I did a lot of school sports, and then I found freestyle wrestling. And I started that when I was 16, and I was the – there was two girls on the high school team. I was kind of the only one that kind of made it to the end. Um, and that was when I found my, like, real, like, sport love. And I went through university um, wrestling, and I was on the national team for a bunch of years. And I traveled the world wrestling. And Wrestling's an intense sport. What's the training like when you're doing that competitively? Oh, my goodness. When I look back. It's endurance. Yeah, it's everything. It's strength, power, endurance, mobility. Like, it. It, it kind of encompasses every part of, like, you know, your physical being. Um, it's just so tough also, like, just destroys your body. That's what I loved about it. It was the toughest thing I had ever done. And so I look back at the training that, you know, we did, and I was just like, you know, we would do two hours of weights every morning. Sometimes there would be technical practices at lunch, and then we'd do a two- or three-hour, you know, actually on-mat wrestling, and we would do team runs, and that was six days a week, and we'd get, you know, one day off. And then during the season, we'd have th three tournaments every month. It was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I look Especially at that now and I'm like, to, like tally it up. You're like, whoa, okay. Because on top of yeah. that, I mean, you're saying you competed as well through schooling. So your regular life's happening in the background. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I did two degrees during that and I was working two jobs. And like, so it was, it's kind of a blur. Yeah. Talk about being prepared to enter the film industry, <laughs> though. All the crazy hours. Yeah. And... <laughs> no, seriously, all of that, I think totally it prepared me. So from wrestling, mm -hmm. where did you go from there? I had finished university and I was really trying to pursue making the Olympic team with wrestling and I came up short and, you know, after a couple tries just knew that my time with that sport was, you know, was done and went through all of the highs and lows of like transitioning out of like not meeting my dream. Like I wanted nothing more than to go to the Olympics since I was five years old, since I knew what it was. And, and so I kind of was, you know, going through the sports trying to, to make it. And so it was really it was really sad and hard to realize that that wasn't going to happen. Um, much easier now to look back and be like, oh, like I still did a lot. And I did it at a very high level that very few people, you know, could reach. And so I'm grateful for that now. But it was harder to see. Well, and it's almost like an idea 
identity crisis too when especially when you have a dream from a young age because you're so focused and then it's to a degree out of your control I mean competition's competition so yeah. it's like you're putting your best foot forward and then it's the now what and that's really hard to deal with at any point in life that happens how did you what did you use to work through that because anyone in sport or athleticism that's come against that it's hard to process it was one of those like okay, now I got to get a real job was, you know, I got to use my degrees. And, and you know, there was, you know, family and personal pressures to like move on kind of quickly. I was fortunate. I had a, a handful of like friends and, and former athletes that had gone through it before, like Olympic champions that then, you know, went on to become, you know, other things and be very successful, whether it was like building a family or a business or, you know, teaching. And so I did, I really like leaned on those people for, you know, support. Um, and I ended up getting a job running a gymnastics center, which was I had coached gymnastics since I was 16. So I, I just love that sport so much. And uh, and I was doing that. And I had found the sport of parkour and free running um, while I was wrestling. And I was training and competing and traveling the world and you know, doing this, meeting some really interesting people. Um, and then I'd also taken up circus. So I started to skill collect, you know, and just really find out what my next thing was. Um, on the side while trying to make a living. And um, I met these people, these parkour athletes that were getting jobs on film sets doing parkour. And and that was the first time that the light bulb went off of, oh, this is like a transferable skill. This is, you know, like a skill that you can make a living off of. And that was the minute I knew that that's what I wanted to do, that I wanted to be a stunt person. And then I look back and I was like, oh, I used to watch Xena Warrior Princess. Yes. I mean, you know that oh show? Yes. <laughs> like Lucy <laughs> Lawless. Um, and I, yeah, and I loved that show. And I just remember watching when she would do those fight sequences and those like acrobatic slides. And you knew that, well, I know now that she was on wires and fly. And I was like, that, like, I want to be that. And, you know, and, and her stunt double, Zoe Bell, was that person that I also, I would think, you know, I admire so much of just how, you know, she's managed her journey and how badass she is and right. continues to be. So that was when I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Oh, that must have been such a good <laughs> feeling to when that you have that light bulb moment and you're just like, feel it literally through the core of your being. Yes. And I, and then I was like... Uh, but how? <laughs> like, <laughs> how do we do you go this? from the cellar into like, oh yeah, right. The I've reality gotta, hits. Yeah, gotta map this out a little yeah. bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I was living in Calgary, and I had a salary job, full time job. I had a condo, and you know, I had all these things. But I, I now knew what I really wanted to do, and I lucked out. And my boss. Um, who's a dear friend of mine now, um, shout out to Amber Heard. She was the facilitator of now what is like my life path. And she was my boss and she's like, Andrea, there are jobs that you love and there's jobs that you're good at. You're really good at this job, but I don't think you love it. And what I was like, boss. and I was just like, is this a test? Am I getting fired? And, and we dove into this conversation of like, what would really make you happy? What does that look like? And I said, I got to move to Toronto or Vancouver and I have to like, you know, and she's like, okay, you have a three month leave of absence. Go try and wow. make it happen. You know, rent out your condo. We went through all of the obstacles that, you know, used Amber, to be. Amber, you are a proper leader. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. That is what leadership yes. is. She and. Wow. Mm -hmm. So to this day, I have all of that. And, you know, it was one of those, I hope you don't come back, but like, we're here if you do. Yeah. And I went and I packed up my tiny little like Toyota Yaris crash mat, literally tied to the top, bikes to the back, packed to the tits with like sporting equipment and all these things. And I knew nobody in Vancouver. And I was just like, okay, like, it was the first time I put all my eggs in one basket. And I was fueled on just the like, hope that it works out. Yeah. And... Um, and within 10 days of being there, I, I really had made no progress. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm never going back. Like, even if I don't make it as a stunt person, like. I can relate to that. Well, and especially for somebody as adventure fueled as you, not to say that in throughout Canada, it's available. Absolutely. But we are very spoiled out here. And also the culture around fitness here is very focused on embracing the outdoors, getting there. Because I know now you reside in Squamish, and so water sports are a huge part of your life as well. 
yeah, I, I mean, my, my husband and I were, you know, kiteboarders. That's the, you know, we've traveled the world kiteboarding. That's what we used to eat, sleep and breathe, you know, before we had a kid. And, um, and now we still try and, you know, fit it in where we can. Um, but that, that was it. As soon as I moved out here, it was, I finally felt like I fit in and I'd always felt like an oddball in all the other places I lived and I just couldn't pieces together and as soon as I moved out here it clicked it was like even aspiring stunt person still suited me you know and there was tons of other people that were doing that same thing and it was just so nice to find that um and then yeah that's how I started my my journey into trying to be a stunt person so you're kind of 10 days in not necessarily making progress but super stoked you've landed in a place that resonates what do those early days look like then because we know that the film industry as a whole quite competitive which I mean, let's face it, at that point, you're no stranger to competition. No. Um, yeah, so it honestly, it was it was kind of a blur because um, I don't know how much you know about the stunt industry and getting into it, but from what I've learned, there's a few different ways to get in. And, like, and I had pieced it together, and, like, one is, you know, you're born into it, right? Your parents are in it, you're exposed to it, so you know what it is. Right. You have those pieces and the opportunity. The other is, like, you're dating someone or you're best friends with someone or you're a teammate with someone Um, because so much of stunts is the relationship and that trust you know with actual other people's lives and so that's so important which is something that I figured out along the way Um, or you grind that was my only (laughs) you're like number three it's gonna be (laughs) I'm I'm willing to sleep to the top (sighs) probably you know I'm in it for the long haul, not the short haul. So um, I literally, I just tried to reach out to as many people as I could. I took, um, I found some stunt people that had gymnastics and parkour backgrounds. And I started taking them for coffee and being like, how did you do it? How did you get in? What do I need to do? What do I, like, what can I start doing now? And, um, you know, it was put together a demo reel of the skills that you already have, you know, put together a basic resume, go get headshots. So you have that package, right? With, and you know this through film and television, like you have to be ready to sell yourself. So get that ready right away and then just start getting to know people so that they know who you are. They know what you can do. They can vouch for you. And one day, like you'll get the call. Do you have to work with an agent as well, or is it more kind of self-soliciting at that point? Yeah, so that's the unique part about stunts, like for acting and background and and all the other parts of film. They typically have agents, right? Even directors and stuff have agents um, to some degree. Stunts, you don't go an agent, so it's it's you. You're showing up and you're hustling and you're you know Kudos. getting to know people and <laughs> yeah, it was it. But it was so exciting. Like, and I'm not saying I was good at it. I'm a like slow relationship burn. I'm not a big oversell. Like my biggest fear is over promising and under delivering. And so I'm like, you know, once you meet me, like, but it's getting in that door is really hard. And um, and I was really fortunate. I had um, I befriended a couple of people that were amazing mentors you know, and were so supportive and they had been very like established performers in the industry before. And, you know, and they introduced me to people and they trusted me and we like built strong relationships and like, you know, and, and so that really helped. That sharing of knowledge is so important. And I'm sure for yourself now, as you've blossom with this incredibly successful career you kind of pay it forward as you go and it's so important because one little conversation or one piece of guidance that you provide for somebody else can then set their path and then everyone's doing well from that it means so much when people are willing to be sharers of knowledge yeah I think that's such a like a a powerful statement because um, I know that you know sometimes in this industry like out of fear people they don't share because you know they're afraid that you know, that means less work for them or, you know, or something or you build someone up and then they go further than you. Um, I was really lucky to be around people that, you know, ascribed to that. There's plenty of work for talented, sane, level headed people. Yeah. And so that was kind of my community that I navigated through. And and then eventually one day I got a call from uh, a coordinator. His name was Lou Bolo. He just passed recently. Um, but he 
was like, all right, kid, this is your chance. And I got brought out on Supernatural as my first job. How did that feel? Tell me about the call, all the things. (laughs) (laughs) That's such a victory after packing up your whole life and hustling like no tomorrow. Yes, and it had been about a solid year and a half, almost two years since I had moved. And I, I... ran the house just screaming crying i was celebrating my at the time well husband now but like at the time boyfriend and i'm like oh my gosh this is my chance and um and it was it was amazing like i there's not words to describe That's how i showed up on set and so scared and you know sweating like ass sweat everywhere it's just like so nervous like i didn't even know i could sweat out of this crevice it's Ye- happening <laughs> All of the crevices, yeah. all of the crevices. And and I finished that. And then, you know, and then within six months of that day, I was working full time. Like it it took a long time to get in that door. And then it just felt like things really. Well, and at that point, it's all you because they bring you on and they know you're new. And then sure enough, you deliver. So yeah. that speaks a lot to your skill set as well. <laughs> Thank you. I did. I, I'm very happy that under pressure I, I delivered and that, you know, I showed up as me and like I gave them what I have and they kept bringing me out and then more people start hiring. And So talk me through that first set because at this point, had you been on a set before? Was all of this new? I'm sure there was a lot of learnings, but anyone that's been in that situation, too, is generally willing to divulge like, hey, first time, but you also kind of want to fake it till you make it. So talk me through the experience. (laughs) I mean, you summed it up kind of perfectly. Um, One of the things that I was told to do was to get in background work to, you know, you watch movies and shows and, you know, those like people sitting at a, you know, at the table, like behind the main actors having conversation. And so that I got an agent for and started working background and that got me on set so I already kind of understood what the general like goings on on set like etiquette all that kind of things most of it is very like common you know is common sense and then I got to actually see stunts being done while I was you know not a part of it and um, so I, I had at least an idea of that that did not um, cure the nerves of general, like the performance nerves, because, you know, as a background performer, no one's really watching you unless you're doing something really wrong. You know, that, and that's kind of your job, right, is to blend in. Whereas, like, the stunt performer, it's, you know, all eyes are on you for the most part for that, that couple of minutes. What have been some of your favorite projects? Because as you say from there, all of a sudden the grind went into it. Now the momentum has built you've made these connections, they're calling you back. So what have been some of the highlights for you? There's a few that really stand out. And I think the first one um, is the first like lead doubling job that I got. And it's on a show called Winona Earp. And it was filmed in Calgary and there was four seasons of it. And I doubled the lead for season two, three and four. And um, Melanie Scrifano is the lead actress. And I absolutely adore her. And um, and she was just so great at kind of helping me with like the performing side of it. But that was my first like I'm doubling the lead actress on a show. And so you're responsible for all of the parts whereas you know sometimes I would only be brought out because I'm a gymnast so you just fall or you know it's like no you have to do the fighting the motorcycle driving you know all you know all of the the aspects of what that care very cool and that was just probably just know it so well if you're doing Mm multi-season such a family well and by the fourth season the coordinator that was running it was just so gracious and brought me into the back end of it. So I got to go to the production meetings and read the scripts and and really invest like in the story and in what goes into it. And and I got to learn so much about what like a day in the life of a coordinator, like what that looks like. It's so easy just to show up and like have fun, but you know what actually goes into it. So that was when I learned the most out of that. And what's your training like when you are assigned to a role? Because obviously you're an active person as it is, but I don't even, what does that involve? Because your day in the life where they're like, Andrea, this is what you're going to do today. It's very different from most people. Yeah, it's not like you're in the office nine to five and you're going to go to the gym from eight till 845. It's like tuck and roll and jump in this and hang from here. So how do you train physically for that? 
Turn your passion for fitness into a career with British Columbia Personal Training Institute. Taught by personal trainers, BCPTI combines classroom and in-gym training to give you the tools needed to succeed in the fitness industry and make an impact. With a simple formula focused on service, science, and sales, prospective personal trainers learn how to gain, train, and retain clients. Visit bcpti.ca for more information. Well, I can't speak for everyone, but for, for me, I... I have like jumped in. I honestly, I've entered being a stunt performer as like, and I treat it as being a professional athlete. That's kind of how I best describe it for myself. I was always trying to be a professional athlete and this is like kind of how I found a way to be that. And so for me, I like, I take that very seriously as far as like training like I did when I was a wrestler or a gym. Right. Well, you have to perform at your optimum for this job. I mean, they expect nothing less if you're walking onto a set. Yeah, correct. Exactly. And and I'm not a, I didn't come in as a specialist. You know, I didn't come in as like, you know, dirt bike rider extraordinaire or, you know, triple black belt karate. You know, that was not or, you know, high diver. Um, I was, you know, a pretty good mover and like I knew where I was in space. I was very physical and I can learn really fast, which was has been my greatest asset. Um, but so for me as a generalist, you need to be a little good at a lot of things. And so I, again, it depends on the day, the week, it's always changing. But if I had a week where I wasn't working, I train a lot. Um, and without exaggerating, I, every day of the week, I will do at least two, maybe four hours of technical training. So that, um, that can be either going to the gymnastics gym and like reminding myself how it feels to flip or, you know, or trick or the parkour gym, or it could be learning a new martial art. Like I've been doing Taekwondo for five years and learning kind of karate and Filipino martial arts and just exposing myself to all the different, you know, jujitsu, all of those things. Um, and spending a lot of time kind of being familiar with the art. So you can kind of try and fake it a bit unless they need a specialist then they bring a specialist and then on top of that I have a personal trainer and so I do my resistance training you know three times a week um, and then I do a lot of like prehab and rehab and I'm constantly doing that and so I will spend a lot of time you know having a massage therapist once or twice acupuncturist like physio all of the things that I need to stay healthy you know and be ready for that because once you kind of go into filming, you have a lot less time for that. So it's a lot of like heavy prep and then you kind of just try and and last. Some shows that I've been on like for a long haul um, with like a team, they call it like the core team. And so you're there kind of every day helping you kind of get the show from beginning to end. And those are really special times because you get to know everyone. You get to be involved in ways that you you don't usually go get to be involved in when you just show up for a day. Um, and those, like, sometimes the people that also really love to train and, and, and do that, they'll show up an hour early before rehearsal and before practice and, you know, get our physical training and our technical training in. And I used to really love that. Well, then it's just community too, right? And you push yourself generally a little bit more on those days as well. Because I'm sure they must happen where you just don't necessarily feel like it, but you have to. And they're the ones that help navigate through that. I'm glad you brought up, though, the prehab and rehab. Have you ever had to navigate through an injury? Because the thing is, if you are a guitar player Ever. and you're planning and it's like your instrument's broken, I'll get another guitar. Your instrument's your body. Yeah. yeah. So what has that looked like? Because you've had a really active and successful career. Um, a lot of it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's... Um, I always, I laugh when they're like, have you ever been injured? And I was like, okay, when I go to like a doctor's office or like a new practitioner, like fill out your like injury history. And I'm like... I'm just going to pick my, like, top five. <laughs> yeah, or you're like, can you take a voice note? My hand will get tired. Yeah. This up. I know. I really should just come with a pre-printed sheet. Um, honestly, most of my actual injuries came from my life before as an athlete. Um, I've been really lucky in stunts that my injuries have been fairly minimal, you know, um, no major concussions or anything like that. I had a lot of concussions when I wrestled that, you know, that you have to manage and deal with now. Um, and I had shoulder surgery when I wrestled. I dislocated my shoulder. I, I broke everything when I, when I wrestled, but yeah. No in, wonder you're hardy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
very durable by this time. We're just very accustomed to constant pain and discomfort. I don't know. The injury management and, pre- and prevention is, I think, from my experience of being sensed, just so essential to your long-term like presence in the stunt industry, I think. And I think that that's a, that's a concept that like stunt performers are now really also buying into. Like I, I'm around people all the time that are, you know, doing all of the like different kinds of physio and exercises and supplementing and, and all of that to stay, you know, as healthy as they can for, for that. And on the other side of it, I get told by like the, um, the more veteran stunt, you know, performers that it's not an, if you get hurt in stunts, it is a win. Um, and the, how bad and for how long it totally varies per person, but you know, it's, it's an extreme industry. Right. And so, you do make peace with it. You are going to get bumps and bruises and that it could, you know, it could be really bad because some of that stuff that you have to do is so intricate and high risk. I think the worst that I've had was a separated shoulder. Um, and that was, I had to like run out this doorway and basically face plant onto a, de- a deck without using my hands 21 times oh my gosh. in the span of like a couple hours, you know? And so <laughs> there was just that one time and you're just kind of tired and you just, Boom! And I was like, "Oh, that didn't feel so." You're like, good. I really did face plant I into did. a door. <laughs> I, mean, I did just boom right on the ground, and you know, and they're like, "Can you go ten more times?" Um, and that took. Uh, did you? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, adrenaline Talk is about a beautiful your wrestling thing. Getting you through as well, having experienced that level of athleticism, because that's a mental game at that point. That's far beyond the physical. A hundred percent. I think that like wrestling gave me so many gifts, but that mental fortitude and that comfortability with being uncomfortable, which, you know, a lot of stunts is just, yeah, being uncomfortable and being okay with it. And that mental game of, you know, I was, um, I was just on a show and we had to be in cold water. That's Mm -hmm. what would get me. (laughs) But, but it was being filmed like somewhere warm. So we're in a t-shirt. And like, you know, and you're in the water and it was fine for the first like hour, two hours of coming in and coming out. By the sixth, seventh hour, I'm like trying to hold my tea and it's spilling everywhere, but I'm trying not to show everyone how cold I am. And, you know, and you're just literally like you just drop in and you're like, like, I will survive this. This is OK. This just feels crappy now. Like there is a warm cup of, you know, whiskey or tea or whatever you want at home. <laughs> Depends on the day. Um and that's the kind of the same thing with injuries. It's just like, I'm not going to die from this. Yes, it hurts. Like, I hear you, body. Like, I'll give you some TLC tomorrow, you know. And how do you work through the mental side of that? Because I know physical fitness, like most people that just recreationally enjoy it, mm-hmm. it's the mental game that really is what propels them to want to continue. Obviously, physical benefits are great, but I think the mental benefits are so huge. But you are asking so much of yourself day in, day out. So how do you keep that mental strength so strong? Um, that's such a good question. Um, I think my my best answer could be I one is the community that I'm around is also they're so – strong and focused, you know, mentally and so capable and confident. And so watching them navigate those situations, like, you know, even out of a little bit of like competitive being like, oh, if they can be that tough, like I can be that tough. No, yeah, it is. And good kind and I, after the last couple of years. <laughs> I was going to say, yes, exactly. I was like, that word just seems, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, it has different meanings now than it did. But it is. It's contagious and inspirational. Like it it really is the like just when, you know, well, we've all been in those points in doing either an activity or just in life where like I don't think that I can like go on. I don't think that like I think I'm done, you know. And most like more often than not, it just is that little switch that you're just like you can you can keep going actually like it's you know and then that feeling of when you do you're like I fucking did that yeah I thought I could do it and I did it I'll do it again well and it becomes evidence for your life as well it's exactly that where you can look back and be like if I have survived this I can survive this and then will you impress yourself endlessly when you do the push through yes it's a really great feeling and like you like you said it once you know you've done it once it's so easy to apply it 
to, you know, the other. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect at it. There are days that I am a, you know, whiny little, oh, you know, like, fuck it this up is so there, hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, my life is so hard. It's fun, but it's hard. Um, you know, and then the next day when you're like, oh, I'm in a sling and, you know, I can't even wipe my own ass. Like, those days then you're like, oh. It's never a fun ride. Was it worth it? And the answer has always been yes so far. But, uh, you know, that, that still took five weeks of me being really like fairly immobile where I had to change my training. Um, you know, I couldn't like hang from a bar or do anything like that. And luckily again, I have like a great personal trainer. Cedo, I used to do circus with her and she's like a magician. Um, and she actually started working with me when I got pregnant, um, two years ago, right during the beginning of COVID. It's like, what else are you going to do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It seemed like a good idea at the time. And uh, and so we she took my body f- through my pregnancy, got all prepped for, you know, birth and delivery, got over to the other side. And then, you know, it was like game time of like, you know, you say injury recovery. And, and when people ask me, like giving birth, like that was my biggest in- injury. People don't talk about that enough. I have not personally forayed into that land, but any friend that I have, they're like, why don't people talk about that more? Because every time you see a movie, it's just glorified of like, whoop, whoop, yeah. whoop we're oh, good. So, <laughs> so nice. Good. I'm glowing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No. It is an insane tax on the body. Literally the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And I I personally did not enjoy being pregnant. I found that so challenging up here. Like that was when I had my biggest struggles. I got really depressed. I had a huge identity crisis. I went from being an athlete my whole life to something else controlling my body and making me fat and like and not allowing me to do all the things that bring me so much joy and you know, and that I identify with. And so that transition was really tricky. Yay for therapy and, you know, yay for a really great support. And yay for people like yourself for saying something. Because again, like friends that I've had that have gone through the journey, they're like, why are we not talking about this more? Because there's no shame in that game. Like no one should have to go through that feeling alone in that feeling because everything else online is projected that you shouldn't feel that feeling and you're like hello we're all feeling that feeling that community of support is kind of what I we felt need more really of, guilty so. for feeling not great about it because everything you see and even some of my friends everything was like this is so amazing I'm like I hope it is for you like that's awesome but that's not my experience and like super stoked about having my son like he's rad But there's still trade-offs and like and that comeback after, you know, giving birth and then, you know, losing 48 pounds. A lot of it was donuts. Super worth it. But like on the back end, that was a little extra work. Squamish has some rad bakeries. Right. So good. (laughs) And yeah. And then I had to work with a pelvic floor physio because like there was stitches and there was a lot of business and action going on down there. Um, And everyone's like, you're going to snap back. And I was like, I literally stretched my abs out to here. And now, you know, that takes time. You're like, things and, have moved. They're yeah, not like, my all organs the, are up yeah. here. There's, it's, guys, it's a thing. It's a scene. And, and so having patience, having grace, having support and having a plan. And, and I did. I, like, I looked, I treated it as, like, recovering from an injury. And, um, you know, out of that, you get a delicious prize that, you know, like, makes your life good and challenging all at the same time. Blend. Yeah. And I, I would say five months postpartum, I was feeling like myself again and feeling capable. I went back. So <laughs> I worked the first 15 weeks of my pregnancy because I found out I was pregnant. And then I was like, well, COVID, like it's it's ruined film industry. That's not coming back for a while. It was the first thing to come back because <laughs> everyone's sitting at home and wants to watch things. And I was like, that was miscalculated, Andrea. OK. Um, and the show that I was on at the time that had taken hiatus, we're like, OK, we're back. And I'm like, I checked with my doctor and we checked with the team and I got the go ahead to and I didn't tell my boss because there's just, you and know, I point, wanted that decision to yes. be my own. And even the nicest of bosses who cares about you is going to make decisions 
to protect you even you know even if you want to make those himself. So I didn't want to put him in that position. Absolutely. So I didn't tell him and I showed up and like, honestly it went smoothly. I was on a wire one day like onto mats. I did a fight scene and That's then be a cool story to tell your son and be like <laughs> right? you were there. <laughs> you, yeah, you did a wire gag and a fight yeah. scene and you rode a motorcycle down the highway like you did some things, kid. Um and so that was such a beautiful way to like send off because by the time that show ended I didn't want to do any stunts anymore and so it was nicely timed and then I came back to work seven weeks postpartum uh my head was really ready to go back into stunts the rest of me that was the biggest shock to my system and uh and I was like I need to like I need to go back and work like I just I need to be me again and my husband was so amazing so he's like okay well you know we're gonna get some nanny help well you know you'll pump like we got this like and uh I went to the rehearsal for the job I was like oh, okay it's a really it's actually a simple straightforward couple of days like I think I had to run and then just like carefully climb through a window and run up to a fence like I had a, I was like, yeah, I could totally do that. Yeah. Yes. So that was what we did the first day. And then day two, the director's like, okay, so that was all great, but now we're going to change it. And I was like, I was like, oh, tell me more. I was like, right. And like, I'm not wearing any pads because like, I'm not going to have to do anything. I was fairly maybe overconfident. Um, also delirious because I wasn't sleeping and doing things. So in all fairness. And they're like, hey, we need you to climb up this fence. And we're actually going to, like, hinge the fence so that you dangle and fall off of it and drop onto all of these pipes and then roll onto the cement ground. And I was like, cool, okay, yep, yeah, mm-hmm, got it. And I remember my boss, like, slapping my back. He didn't know I had a kid and was just like, you pat it up? I'm like, I'll be fine. And then they call action and I climb up and it was all a blur and I just remember being down on the ground and and they're like, Wow, that fall looked real. I'm like, oh, it was. I had no abs. I could not climb that fence. I literally just fell off of it. Like, and that was when I realized I was like, I did not give my profession enough respect going in and like what it actually takes to do our job, even the simple things, right? And that yeah. that that is like such an important we have to be ready for anything. And so I was super grateful for the experience. I survived. I walked away from it. I definitely drove home crying. Be like, what am I doing? <laughs> And then I um, and then I hit the gym for another month with my trainer and got some abs back so I could like hang and crawl and just got so much more confident in my body again. And then when I went back to work that next time, then I was I was ready. I knew what I was getting into. And it was, oh, I'm back. Oh, this is what it feels like. Oh, OK, like oh, it I must am. Have felt so good to be back in your stride, too, because it is an identity shift at first. And yours is just multi layered because you cannot help that you've asked a lot of your body in a big way. And then you're asking it to do it in a completely converse way. Yeah. Yeah. It was um, it was just it was a really cool transformation. It was really empowering because I think that the one thing I knew to be true was when we had agreed to like have kids, what was lying for me on the other side was totally unknown. Whether I could go back to work as a stunt person, whether I wanted to, whether, you know, what that looked like, I didn't know. And that unknown is really scary, especially when you already like what you know. <laughs> like I really liked being a stunt, you know, performer. I really liked being that, you know, that selfish person that can grab their husband and, you know, go on a vacation for a couple of weeks and surf and kite and then come back and work. I really loved that, the lifestyle that we had. And then we're like, let's, you know, let's adopt two dogs and get pregnant. Okay. <laughs> go through a pandemic. I like that you use the word there, empowering and empowerment, because I know that that's a huge pillar of who you are as a person in regards to instilling that in others and particularly instilling that in other women. So talk to me about Live Your Fierce. Okay. Um, where to start with Live Your Fierce? Um, I think that full disclosure, Live Your Fierce, the, the pandemic put a lot of our initiatives and what we can do on hold. And so I will speak to like how it started and where in the next little bit I'm hoping it goes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I like just even love the essence of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, So Live Your Fierce came many, many moons ago from my love for coaching. Like I... 
that's probably my number one calling is coach. I coached gymnastics like ages two to 75, you know, since I was 16. And there was just something that I absolutely loved watching people learn something for the first time and then go from, I can never do that and progressing to the other side of, I can't believe I just did that. And when I was teaching parkour, um, I collaborated with a few other parkour artists and a gym in Calgary at the time. And we put together this day, which was um, uh, Varkour um, day, um, for reasons that I'll let you figure out why it was Varkour over (laughs) parkour. I I was so funny when I was younger. Very funny. That is quite hilarious. And I mean, lots of you know that you really hit your Varkour if you miss the landing. One. Now you really get it. (laughs) Yes, I'm going to leave it at that because you nailed it. Um, And what I was finding was for women especially, like I never had a problem going in like a room of dudes and doing my sport or learning or, you know, or fail. Like that never was um, an obstacle for me to learn or get involved. Like wrestling, it was literally just dudes that, you know, you're sweating around and, you know, and, and that kind of thing. And parkour was the same. It was a very male dominated sport at the time. Um, and I just would notice these girls that would come out and be so interested in learning it. And then as soon as there was male practitioners or male coaches, the dynamic changed and it went into a they would watch or they would be too nervous to try because they'd be afraid to fail or whatever was, you know, going on. But there was a very like observable shift. It's like that gym intimidation. Yes. That yeah. people get hit with and all of a sudden you're so in your head and worried about what they'll think or can I do it or will I fail or you've kind of failed in the mind before you give it a shot. And it's hard to take that step. It is. It is. And that was when I became determined to try and like just impact a couple people. And so I started like teaching just women's classes and you teach it differently, you know, like our bodies are different and, you know, and generally the way that we approach learning things is different. And, you know, the just huck it is just, it never spoke to me, you know, I was just like, (laughs) I got hips and I like to live and like I am a little afraid of death like I'm gonna maybe do it differently (laughs) and uh, and so then we created this day to give back and it was a free day of parkour instruction a full day and we would fly out some of the top female instructors from North America and they would you know children ages five to whatever um, and they would come and they would learn parkour in a gym and then we'd take them outside and it was really about like removing obstacles and barriers to like entry and learning something new and and building that um that like self-empowerment and um you know there was a one year we had over 70 women in that and like the moms that would drop their kids off I was like why aren't you staying oh oh I, I can't do that like parkour is not for me I'm like can you step up onto the box and by the end you know they've walked along a rail and they've and you know, their minds are blown. And that to me was like the most fulfilling feeling. Well, ever. and they're leaving on a high too. Yes. I just did that. And then I'm high off of their high and then we're yes. all high. And it was just <laughs> like, I get so jazzed. And, and then it was actually um, my, our favorite leader, Amber, who we got together because, you know, we became friends very early on. And then outside of, you know, once I left, we stayed friends. She was my bridesmaid in my wedding. Like, you know, Amber, uh, I don't know you, but you're a gem. She's just (laughs) fucking amazing. And, um, and we were just like, we want to do this for other women and how can we build something up? And it, we flirted with many iterations. And I think the most powerful part of live your fierce was that Amber went through a journey of like, you know, where she felt like she wasn't living her fierce and so didn't feel right, you know, stepping, you know, in and being that person that's trying to teach other people living your fears. And then I went through this whole thing of like, I didn't feel it. And, and we've come out the other side now where we both feel like we're, we're doing that now. We're finally like, okay, we've, we've actually lived that journey of like, I can't do it. I, you know, like, am I ever going to make it? Like, am I good enough? All these kind of things. Or how do I figure out how to do it? Um, and just, yeah, we, we it's almost a bit self-serving. Like, I, I think you shared a bit of it of, like, why you wanted to have this to- these talks and meet these people was that you, you know, get something. You're, the cup fills. And then you know that 
simultaneously, though, it's almost like this transfer of energy that even if it's just to one person at the end of the day, yes, your cup is full. And maybe you view that as selfish, but I still view as the putting it out there and the willingness to want to cultivate that. It comes out of wanting to cultivate that in another. I like and that. that's quite magical. I really like that. I like how you put that. And I think that is what we want to do from that. And so whether it's, I think we're going to start small and do like, you know, events where it's just, we want women to enter something outside of the mindset of, ooh, I can't for all of these reasons. And I think there's so much power in teaching in girls and women of all ages that like, it's not a, no, you can't. It's a how you can and, you know, and I, I constantly live that while I'm trying to, like, navigate and be a better stunt performer. Um, like, I'm not there yet. I'm not at the top of my career yet. There's so many things I haven't done yet. I have peers that have, you know, worked on, you know, Marvel movies and, you know, doubled some incredible actors and, like, have done things that I, like, yearn to experience, right? And so I keep chasing that. I keep collecting those. And every time I enter something, I'm like, how am I, you know? going to learn this and then you chip at you know I'm like okay well I have to walk my talk and you have to you chip at it and you like solicit help from experts like people want to share their knowledge and and uh, if you're not afraid to ask and like and take that time like I I impress myself constantly with those kind of little things you're such a dynamic human being and I really appreciate that you have such a story of perseverance as well through so many different stages of your life because that's an element of human like humanity and being a human being on this earth that we need to remember we have that available to us and sometimes it's easy to forget that we have the option to persevere through the tough bits so I think there's a lot to be gained from someone like you sharing your story. Before we let you depart, I do like to just ask for you to share a little tidbit of motivation or inspiration, something that's maybe been imparted on you that is something you hold on to, to either move through those moments or to get you where you've gotten. That's so good. I'm super glad that you didn't give me the heads up. You were it's more fun that question. way because yeah. then people just pull it out of their brain and then yeah. you just never know um, what. I think I carry this post-it in my wallet that my favorite person gave me and it just says, keep being awesome. And I have had that for eight or nine years in my wallet and that is the reminder. And what that says to me when I when I even just picture it in there with the, her writing and the exclamation point, it's like, be yourself, follow Jim, because like, we don't have forever on this planet. And as I know that's so know, cliche. Yeah, yeah. And and so there's I find so much power in that of like getting rid of that stuff that really doesn't matter and like and to stop worrying what people think you should be doing and think of how you should be doing. And I wasted a lot of my like younger formidable years, you know, trying to please people and and guess what? Some you know, would make spend them their happy. Whole lives in that mode. And I feel so happy to say that I am a recovering people pleaser and like and it's a constant journey. Um, But that keep being awesome and whatever that means to you, whether that's like be the best damn mom, you know, can or like be constantly fit and healthy or, you know, be a good friend or be like a badass stunt person or, you know, whatever it is like that for me is enough. I hope See, that answers This your is why I tell people <laughs> not in advance because you pull out gems like that. Andrea Ross, keep being awesome. I so appreciate your time. You have such a fascinating journey, a lot of heart, and I truthfully cannot wait to follow your journey from here because it sounds like you're still traveling to amazing places. Well, thank you so much. And you have filled my cup today, honestly. And I look forward to hearing all the other guests that you get to interview because this is such a really wonderful concept. Oh, thank you. You've just listened to All Things Fitness and Wellness, the Celebrity Series. This episode was brought to you by the British Columbia Personal Training Institute. Learn how to train, gain, and retain clients. New episodes of the Industry Series drop every Monday and the Celebrity Series every Wednesday. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe so you never miss out on hearing from industry thought leaders and influencers. We are on a mission to help everyone live a life fit and well.